you all about an idea that we have. It's an idea for how we can fight gender inequality, help improve the field of scientific study, and help save the planet all at the same time. So I know this sounds kind of ambitious, right? But we, we firmly believe that storytelling is the way we can do this. So the best way to kind of explain what we mean by this is to start by introducing you to my niece, Alice. True <laughs> so My name is Alice Cook. <laughs> yeah, okay. This is my niece Alice. <laughs> I'm six. I have an eight-year-old brother. Um, what are some of your favorite subjects in school? Recess. <laughs> Why do you like recess? Because I get to do anything I want. I get to talk to my friends and play with my friends. Yeah. So you, you like that kind of freedom, huh? Yes. What are some subjects you don't like? Math. What, well, what do you think about science? I like science. What do you like about it? Mm, doing the science experiments. So what, what do you want to be when you grow up? A person who goes around the, goes around the world studying the animals. Oh yeah, what what is that? I don't know. <laughs> you know that's probably a scientist. Probably. Yeah. Uh, what kind of scientist do you want to be? What kind? What do you want to study about animals? The different features that they have and what they do to protect the, the, themselves from predators. I see. It's really interesting. What got you interested in that? Um, my four cats. Oh yeah, how do they protect themselves? By biting, <laughs> and barking, and doing stuff like that. I see. What do you like about animals? Everything. Okay, so how many of you, like Alice, love animals as a kid? Wow. Almost everyone in the room. So how many of you ever thought that you might want to work with animals when you grew up? And how many of you actually work with animals today? <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so, Cindy and I personally relate to Alice because as little kids, we loved animals and we really, really wanted to work with them when we grew up. So here's a photo of me as a little girl. Um, this is from one of my family's canoeing trips in Canada. I think I was really lucky. I grew up with a dad who was an outdoor guide and a naturalist, and I got to do these crazy trips canoeing for a month. I also happened to go up next to Shenandoah National Park. And so my backyard was these woods, and I would tromp around and see black bears and barred owls and red-headed woodpeckers and lots and lots of other species. Beyond that, at home, I was really lucky because I had a lot of pets and a lot of fish and fish tanks, and I just absolutely loved animals. One of the things that I did um, was adopt a whale. And so every month I'd get these little brochures and it would talk about Misty the humpback whale and it would show me, you know, her tail and I would hear about her recent migrations and if you know, she had a new cat and that kind of thing. And I just loved water and I wanted more than anything in the world to be a marine biologist. So my background is a little different from Maggie's. This is where I grew up in New York City. Um, we didn't have as much wildlife, you know, there's there's pigeons and, and squirrels and the occasional rat here and there. But, you know, like Alice, I also learned about animals through pets. I didn't have many of my own, um, but I went around the neighborhood and I recorded meticulously the, the dogs in my neighborhood, the, the type of breed it was, the size, the temperament. You know, it's like this little dog database of like a two-block radius. 
becomes very official. <laughs> so as you can see, Cindy and I were both wild about animals and loved them. Um, but as passionate as I was about animals and as big as my dream was, as I got older and older, I started feeling less and less confident. I started feeling like I'm not the best at math. I'm not getting the best math standardized test scores. So I'm probably not qualified to be a scientist. And the things that I'm good at, that's not really what scientists do. So eventually I just I gave up on that dream. And for me, again, like Alice, you know, I just didn't see the connection of having like a passion for animals and science. To me, science was that class that I was taking that I wasn't very good at, where I had to memorize a lot of facts that I didn't quite grasp and try to pronounce words that I couldn't really pronounce. Yeah, so today Cindy and I, you know, we're not standing in front of you as scientists, we're standing in front of you all as storytellers. And we started asking ourselves, why? Kind of what happened that led us to sort of gradually and then completely abandon these powerful childhood dreams? And what we came to was this. So, some of you may recognize this. This is a story that we were fed about what it means to be a scientist. We were given the idea that a scientist is essentially an older white man in a white lab coat. So, you see this version, uh, uh, you see versions of this stereotype kind of everywhere in media and film. You know, the absent-minded professor, the naughty professor, the, the nerd that can't seem to get a date, or the guy that spends his, all his time in the laboratory and somehow he saves the world by clicking on a computer. You know, the White House recently reported that STEM, for STEM depictions in family films, men outpace women five to one. This is the story we are feeding to children. Yeah, so the story from when we were children and the story that Alice is inheriting today aren't really different. Um, and so we started talking about this problem and we talked about this skill sense that we do have, which is in storytelling. And we came up with our own idea for how we might be able to address this challenge. So our idea is wild women, stories from, the women, from women on the forefront of wildlife conservation. And what wild women is, is it's an illustrated series for kids that pairs the unexpected and the inspiring life stories of female conservation scientists from all over the world, along with the signs of the species that they're passionately working to protect. And what we were really curious about when we started this project was how did each woman herself find her own deep connection to the natural world and to wildlife? But then beyond that, um, how did she actually channel that into and really practically building a career, what we weren't able to do. What were her challenges? Um, who has been really helpful in supporting her? And what are the values that she brings into her pursuits and her practices of science today? And so actually what we found were, was pretty surprising. Our assumptions as kids were not quite true. Um, the path to science, the path to a career in science, isn't necessarily paved with straight A's in biology and math or having an encyclopedic knowledge about the table of elements. And in fact, things like empathy, teamwork, things that we actually possess were the things that brought people to the field of science. So I think a really good example of this is one of the women we started talking to while developing the project. and. I was asking her, you know, about her own pathway in science, and she was saying, you know, as a kid, I really, I wasn't academic. I didn't like academics. I didn't get great grades. I loved team sports, and she played basketball. And she was so good at basketball that she went to play basketball in college. So fast forward um, many years later, and here she is. This is Amanda, and she's in Malawi, in Sub-Saharan Africa, working in the field. And she encounters situations like this frequently. So she, I think in this photo, um, has had an elephant that's been seriously injured because of an attempt at poaching, right? And so she has to rush in and figure out how to do an emergency operation on this elephant to try to save its life. So I don't know, but I think it would be pretty hard to do that alone. It's actually impossible to work in the field alone, both for the safety of the animal and for the safety of the people. So what she told us is that for her, all of those years playing basketball and really developing her muscle and the skill of teamwork 
and in communication during very complex, rapidly evolving situations is what enables Amanda to work in Malawi, not only you know, doing emergency operations on elephants, but rhinos and so many other animals every day. So why do we want to bring stories like Amanda's to children like Alice? And how, actually, can we do the things that we said in the beginning? Fight gender inequality. Improve the scientific field. Help save the planet. Yeah, so we know that storytelling is really, really critical for all of us, right? Because it's how we sort of set our imaginations free, but it also, in this case, can be how we set our imaginations wild, I would say. But storytelling alone isn't enough. It's actually how the storytelling is done, and it's what children actually see. It's who they see. It's whose stories are privileged, whose voices are including, with what amount of nuance we tell the stories, and to what a degree we are able to explore different people's realities and think about how they reflect on our own lives. And we think as we have more representation and more voice in storytelling, we'll see young women like this one be able to much more confidently go out into the world and pursue their paths and contribute the impact that they want to, to see. Um, and there was a scientist, another scientist we talked to, and she was saying, in the field of uh, science, biodiversity is really, really, really important, right? To have an important fire. You need to have lots of species, lots of plants. That's, that's what is the, the signal. In science, diversity of the types of people, diversity of representation of people's backgrounds, where they come from, their life experience, is equally important. Because that's when we get a diversity of ideas. And ideas are solutions. And when we live in a world where we have the climate crisis and so many other human and environmental challenges, diversity of representation is key. And we think storytelling is the key to that. And so if we can actually reshape our imaginations like this, then scientists will start not just looking like this, <laughs> but like this, or like this, or like this. <laughs> 